Your theory grows out of evolutionary psychology. It's, it's a theory about what reasoning faculties were designed for uh, by natural selection. Um, and let me introduce it, if you'll let me indulge in a little bit of self-promotion. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in 1994, when evolutionary uh, psychology was just taking shape, I wrote this book, The Moral Animal. Um, and when I first heard about your theory, I was reminded of a little part of it. There's a paragraph... Uh, and I want to read, and I want to see uh, uh, how much of your theory it captures, and how much it doesn't capture. Th mm -hmm. This again, this was when the the, uh, the the field was kind of just taking shape, and and here's what I wrote: uh, the proposition here is that the human brain is, in large part, a machine for winning arguments, a machine for convincing others that its owner is in the right, and thus a machine for convincing its owner of the same thing. Uh, the brain is like a good lawyer, given any set of interests to defend. It sets about convincing the world of their moral and logical worth, regardless of whether they in fact have any of either. Like a lawyer, the human brain wants victory, not truth. And like a lawyer, it is sometimes more admirable for skill than for virtue. Now, when I first, when I first read in the New York Times an account of your theory, uh, as laid out in this paper I referred to, um, at first I thought, well, that sounds just like what I said, I mean, you know how that works, like whenever you hear an idea that sounds anything like one of your ideas, you, you say, wait a second, I said that first. And in fact, that is relevant to what you're talking about, right? Like mm -hmm. one of the biases is to think we deserve more credit than we actually deserve and to think that other people deserve less credit than they, I mean, you, I don't think you get into that a lot in this paper, but it's kind of a documented thing and, and it's mm -hmm. not irrelevant. But what I want to ask is, I mean, then, then as I looked at your paper, I thought, well, actually, I mean, there are some differences here between this and what I said. One is that, of course, this is whereas mine was kind of an empirically formed hypothesis, maybe. You're now trying to work this out into a full-fledged theory, which is a different enterprise. And you say it makes certain predictions, let's test them, and so on. But also, tell me if I'm wrong here. I think your view is maybe a little rosier or less or less uh, relentlessly cynical than the view that embodied in that paragraph of mine. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's completely right. The main difference, I think, is that um, for us, we we not only stress how people produce arguments, and, and there we would agree with you that it's you know mostly to convince others, but the fact that we also have to evaluate other people's arguments, and that when we do this, um, then the goal is to is to try to uh, make sure that the arguments are right, and not only so that we can discard bad arguments, but also that so that we can recognize good ones and then change our minds. And if there wasn't this balance, you know, then there would be no point producing arguments because, I mean, if, 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 if it was widely known that the arguments are purely kind of self-centered and that you don't care at all about them being, you know, actually good arguments, no one would pay any attention to them. And then it would become useless producing them. And, and basically the, the framework we, we, um, we set ourselves in is that of the evolution of communication. And so we know that for, uh, for communication to be stable in a, in a species, it has to be beneficial both for those who send and for the for those who receive, and it's the same. The same is true for argumentation. Argumentation, so by by definition, is a part of communication, and so it has to be beneficial both for those who you know communicate arguments and those for those who receive yeah. them. Well, well, yeah. Well, here's the way I see it, which I, is kind of the same way, although maybe a little less rosy. So, for communication to evolve in the first place. There has to be a commonality of interest between sender and recipient, right? For mm -hmm. communication to exist almost, there, almost, there, there has to be a non-zero-sum relationship initially between the two. Uh, but because in a purely zero-sum relationship, when there's no commonality of interest, there's no incentive to honestly communicate about anything. There's no incentive to believe anything the other person yeah. says. So, and, and of course... Um, evolution features uh, commonalities of interest. For one thing, there are kin, there are close kin, you know, who share genes. And so, you know, it's like you, you want to communicate a certain amount of honest stuff to your offspring, to your siblings, mm -hmm. on evolutionary, on Darwinian grounds alone. So there's that. Now, so, so commun that has to be the case for communication to come into existence. On the other hand, once communication exists, there is, um, it makes sense uh, to exploit it to selfish ends, right? Like if I have a difference of interest with you, like there's some resource we both want and we both want to argue that we deserve it. I say I deserve it, you say it. It makes sense that the brain would evolve uh, mechanisms for something other than what you might call purely honest communication, right? Yeah, you yeah, know, exactly. So um, 
that's actually one of the reasons why we think argumentation evolves. So the first and more precisely the rationale that we that we put forward for the evolution of argumentation is that uh, there is this this issue of trust that you are describing in communication because the even though there has to be some kind of commonality of interest the interests never really completely overlap and so the senders always have some kind of incentive to manipulate uh, you know kind of deceive uh, receivers and so um and so you have to have mechanisms to make sure that on the whole the senders are mostly honest or again most of the messages are beneficial to the receivers and so one of the ways uh, humans do this is that they calibrate their trust so you can uh, try to gauge who is you know who is competent who is incompetent who is kind of you know nice towards you and who is who isn't nice um but the problem with trust is that it's often kind of long to build and it can be kind of easily destroyed and um, and we think that and, and it's kind of sort of relatively imprecise. So I can sort of sort of trust someone, but you know there are kind of sometimes you want a more fine-grained mechanism to tell whether that specific message should be should be believed or not. Mm -hmm. And we think that it, this is what argumentation does. So you know in many cases you don't trust people enough to just take their word for something. But then if you, if they give you strong enough arguments, you might change your mind. So in a way, argumentation would be a way of overcoming. Uh, this vigilance that we have towards uh, towards uh, towards uh, senders, so that we can better discriminate when we should listen to them and when we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in the in the first instance, um, to begin with, the fact that each of us is going to try to exploit the communication system to our ends means that each of us is probably going to evolve what you you call, I think, epistemic vigilance or something. Mm -hmm. This exactly. ability to critically analyze arguments, again, not necessarily from an objective perspective, but at least to see what uh, what kind of uh, weaknesses they have from your point of view, what logical weaknesses there are. So that, that but that does strengthen a, a, a logical faculty, the, this ability to pick apart arguments, even if you're using it to selfish ends. Mm 